about the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's joy in the name of Jesus. There is peace in the name of Jesus. Isn't God good this morning? There is something about that name, Jesus. If Jesus can't make you happy, then no one can. There is something about the name of Jesus. As our young people leave this morning, I would like to thank you all for my formal look. If y'all know me, y'all know I'm not this formal. But this is going to be my first Sunday get up. Um, and I thank each and every one of you who contributed and um, gave me this gift for my one year here. Um, I feel good in it. I don't know how I look, but I feel good. <laughs> Amen. All right. Uh, <laughs> all right. If, we, if you would stand with me, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 4. And we're going to look at verses 5 through 15. And um, we're going to continue our series sermons, series of sermons on old, old lessons from the Old Testament. Lessons from the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 4, verse 5 through 15. And it reads this way from the New King James. It says, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And talking about God. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. And so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance failed? If you do well, you, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and it desire is for you, but you should rule over it. And some translations say master over it. And now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, and Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he says, I do not know. I am, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hands. And when you till the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. A a fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great than I, than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of your ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, Whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone find him should kill him. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, I want to look at this text from the vantage point, Cain's response to God. Cain's response to God. Let us pray before we begin. Lord, we ask you to open up our hearts and our minds so that we can receive what you have for us today. Lord, have your manifested presence come down in this place and meet us where we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 How did Cain respond? Someone once said that correction is like going to the dentist. You don't want to go. But after you've gone and you're done, you're glad you went. And so this morning, we're going to look at how Cain responded to God's correction. The last time we looked together at chapter 4 of Genesis, we noticed that when Cain and Abel worshiped God, Abel's worship pleased God because his heart towards God was right, while Cain's was not. And what I want to remind us of this morning is that how you worship God matters how you worship God matters and I'm and I'm not talking about your actions how what you do and how you do it but I'm talking about your heart 
You see, God wants your heart to be right when you worship him. And it is when this context this morning, I want to start looking at verses 5 through 15. And I want us to start by pondering a few questions. When the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin, how do you respond? Do you seek to make things right? Do you come before the Lord in worship and confession with a humble and contrite heart? Or, or, or do you uh, get ticked off? Do, do, do you pout? Do, do you do all the things that we saw Cain doing? You see, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah says it best when he says, But to this one I will look to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my words. And that should be our model on how we should respond to God's correction with humility and a contrite heart. And that leads us to our first lesson this morning that is found in the latter part of verse 5. And the lesson is we need to be mindful of God's correction. We need to be mindful of God's correction. If you look at the latter part of verse 5 of chapter 4 of Genesis, when Cain learned that God had no regard or didn't respect his offering, it says, and he, Cain, became very angry and his countenance fell. And his countenance fell. You see, Cain became angry with God because of what he did, not because of what God did, but Cain became angry. And rather than concerning himself about fixing the situation or pleasing God, no, Cain became very angry. And we must stop here and ask these questions of ourselves. How do we respond when God says no? Or how do we respond when God says, I don't like the way you are doing something? You see, when Sister Sylvia got up here this morning, I was a little nervous because she was giving us correction. But how do you respond to that correction? You see, sometimes God will say no. Sometimes God will say, I don't like the way you are doing something. I don't like the way you're treating your wife or your husband or your children or your neighbors. Or, 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 or God may say, I don't like the way you are attending church. Your attendance record may be poor. I don't like the way uh, how you're treating uh, this married woman or this married wife. Or I, I, God might say, I don't like the way you are doing the things you're doing at work or at home or in the secrecy of your heart. You, you see, when God says no, how do you respond? So do you get mad? Do you get offensive? Do you get upset? Do you get angry with God or people around you? Not too long ago, in, in my classroom, I corrected a student for cheating. And the student Instead of trying to correct it, he gets mad at me and proceeds to cuss me out. Now, I should be mad at him, but he cusses me out because I, he says, because I confronted him about his cheating in front of the class. You, you see, that's like many Christians. I, I've seen it happen many times in church when, when the pastor or, or the deacons or, or the motherboard goes to a particular person in the church and tells them in love what they are doing wrong. And, and, and they oftentimes receive an attitude. You've heard it. You've seen it. You, you, you know it happens all the time. Let, let, let's bring the rubber to the road. I, I used to be a young adults and youth pastor. And I learned quickly that when you confront young people about their their sins, their first reaction is oftentimes one of outward anger to cover up the inward embarrassment and guilt and shame that they have. I, 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 I've seen it a lot of times. When you confront young people, for example, about sex before marriage, they, they get mad at the preacher. You, you know what I'm talking about. You, you, you know what they say. It, it's not your business. It's my business. Why are you in my business? And oftentimes, uh, these same young people leave the church because they said... 
they are too much in my business. I, I, they are essentially saying, I don't want to be accountable to other people and most importantly to God. You see, these people are the same people who will go from church to church because they don't want to be responsible or accountable to anybody. You, you, you see, these are the people that God is talking to this morning that you have to be able to respond to God's correction in the right way. You, you, you see, you, you, you can't be nervous or scared or anxious or, or, or upset when someone comes to you in love and tells you that you're doing something wrong. You, you, you see, sometimes I, I have to think twice when, when you talk about uh, giving correction to adults. You, you, you know, but I was reminded the other day by one of my preachers that it, it's, it's not about me and it's not about that sin. It's about that person that you're trying to direct in the way that God has them go. He, he, he reminded me that a preacher is not about what the membership, it's about you being accountable for someone's soul. And if you are accountable for someone's soul, it is your responsibility. It's your duty. It's what you should be doing. You should correct people even if it makes you feel uncomfortable, even if it makes that person feel uncomfortable. And even if that person leaves the church, there has to be some type of standards we have to live by. You see, sometimes people and, and pastors are, are scared to talk about the hard issues. You, you see, that's why you don't hear a lot of preaching up, about living right, living up to God's standards. You, you don't hear a lot of good preaching anymore about homosexuality or sex before marriage or pornography or over drinking or smoking or drugs or cussing or racism or sexism or abortion. You don't hear that kind of preaching anymore, but the word of God says to us that yes, we should preach those things in tolerance that God loves us and gives us grace, but those kinds of things should not be tolerated in the body of Christ. You see, we oftentimes need to be reminded it's not about us. But it's about the person that God puts you in to direct them in the right path. So the question I remain to ask you this morning is, how do you respond to God's correction? You see, in the text, we see that Cain gets angry. Now, now, do you have a problem with your temper? Do, do you have a problem with your anger? Do, do you have a problem when someone tells you that you need to correct something? I, I, I read about an interaction between a pastor and a member, and, and it goes something like this. One uh, lady said to her pastor, I occasionally lose my temper, but it's over quickly. And the pastor simply replied, so is an atomic explosion. But think about the damage it causes. So is a hurricane. But think about the destruction it leaves. So is a bullet fired from a gun. But think about the death it could cause. You see, we must not assume that unrighteous anger is ever justified or appropriate. We, we need to be mindful of how we handle situations in our lives. Husbands, be careful how you speak to your wives. Wives, be careful how you speak to your husband. Parents, be careful how you speak to your uh, 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 children. You, you, you see, I, I, I used to didn't have to get up here and say, children, be careful how you speak to your parents. Because I remember the day that if you spoke to your parent in a misunderstandable uh, way or a way that was upsetting to them, they would jack slap you real quick and you'd be in your place. But nowadays, I, I hear uh, interaction between parents, the, the, the children speak to the parents any old type of way. So this morning I have to stand up and say, we all need to be careful how we speak and handle each other. For there is lasting effects of how you speak to someone. You, you see, God wants us to be representatives of him. And God says that we should love one another. So whatever we do in interaction with one another, it should be in love. And, and, and that's why this text is so important for us this morning. Now, I, I know most people don't like correction, whether it's in marriage or the workplace or at church or receiving correction in the home. It's tough, yet it is an unescapable fact that correction is a huge tool for growth, transformation, and personal development. You, you see, 
People who constantly reject correction are, are stunted in their growth. These are the kind of people that go from job to job because when their boss tries to correct them for something, they get mad and leave and say, what business of that? I, I could work any way I want to. You, you see, these are the type of people who, who are in marriage after marriage after marriage because they don't want to be corrected about their doing something wrong. You see, be still and listen to what God wants you to do. Be corrected. Grow from your correction. That's what the message is this morning. You, you, you see, the right response to God's correction should be one of understanding. You see, oftentimes God will send correction through other people who are not perfect themselves. So don't let the person hamper what God has to teach you. You, you see, don't let the person be a blinder to what God's message is for you. you. You see, sometimes people try to rationalize the correction away and say, look at their life, look at how they're, what are they doing, and all this kind of stuff. But I'm here to remind us this morning that if God can produce praise from a rock, I'm sure he can teach you something from an imperfect person. Uh, even if the person is someone you may not like or you don't even respect, you see, you need to check it, but take the correction and use it for what it's worth. You, you, you see, how should we respond to God? We should respond to God. It should be one of emotional control. You, you see, oftentimes when someone is being corrected, they, they get mad, they get upset, they get angry. They, they, they even oftentimes or sometimes will get violent. And, and, and as I said before, that it happens because they're trying to cover up their true feelings of oftentimes shame and guilt and embarrassment. And, and so don't let your emotions control your actions. So stop, think, let God speak to you before you react. Now, it's sad that I have to say this, but I, I, I had to say this to my oldest son not too long ago. And I was speaking to him about um, being stopped by the police if he was in a car with his friends. And I told him that even if you feel that the cop is wrong, even though you, you might feel that the cop is being unjust to you, that keep your emotions under control. Don't, don't, don't let your emotions get you hurt get you arrested or even get you killed. You, you, you see, it, it's sad that I have to say this, but our young boys particularly, that they, they need to be taught that they can be killed for saying the wrong thing to the wrong person. And, and so keep your emotions under control. You see, the right response to God's con correction should not only be one of understanding, one of self-control emotionally, but it should also be one of learning. It, it should be an opportunity to stop, lean in, and learn. You, you see, because God will use human vessels oftentimes to bring us our correction, and, and, and not every correction will be completely true. But nearly all correction have at least a kernel of truth in them. And so if someone is coming to you and correcting you, take that kernel and use it as a tool of growth. You see, wise people allow correction to grow them, to change them. You see, even at work, even in the church, we oftentimes need to be corrected. You, you, you see, my, my kids and my wife oftentimes correct me because they say I'm too curt when I speak to them. And so they're oftentimes times corrected me and say watch how you speak and, and so I need sometimes to be corrected so how should you respond to God's correction it should not only be one of understanding it should not only be one of emotional control it should not only be one of learning but it should also be one that should give you an opportunity to lead you, you, you see we in this context can't lead others to places we have not gone you, you see people are watching us people will look at you people will see how you respond to somebody correcting you and if they see you responding in the right way of how you should respond to correction then they will get a cue so even in Correction, you can lead other people. Remember that you are to be modelers of Jesus Christ. Amen? So receiving correction with wisdom and humility is a powerful example to others. And that leads us to our second lesson for this morning. Is that God will oftentimes force us to look at our mess 
God will force us to look at our mess. Now, if you look at verse 6, the, the, the Lord pursues Cain with three consecutive questions. He says, why are you angry? And, and then he says, and why has your continence failed? And then he says, if you do well, will not your continence be lifted? You see, God was not pleased with Cain and his offering. And, and the first two questions demonstrate that he was even more disappointed with Cain's response than he was with the initial not doing what he needed to do with his worship. You, you see, God knew the answer to all three of the questions. He knew that Cain's heart was not right towards God. You see, God does the same thing towards us. God pursues us even when we are in the midst of our mess. You see, God loves us so much. He is going to pursue us in the midst of our troubled times, in the midst of our circumstance. God is always there for us. He, 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 he will pursue us and, and he will get us to, to, to look at our mess in our lives. He oftentimes will use sickness. He will use some hard things in life. He, he will use pain. He will use our trials so that we can look at our mess. You see, God loves us so much. He is willing to draw us near to him with our hard times in our lives. It's just like parents. Parents who care enough to punish, to, to correct their children. You see, you, lazy parents, from the child point of view, at, at first, they would say, I have a good parent. They let me do whatever I want to. But we all know that that is not a good parent. A good parent loves enough gets up from watching television, gets up from going to here and there, and they spend time with their children, and they punish in them, and, and they're doing the right thing for their children so that their children can grow up and be the men and women of God. Just like parents care enough for their children, God loves us so much that he is willing to correct us, even our trials and our tribulation. God loves us so much that he is going to grow us and he's going to teach us through all our situations. And, and that brings us to our third lesson. We have to choose to sin. We have to choose to sin. If you look at verse 7, it, it, it says, and if you do not do well, sin, and this is a different translation from what I read, is crouching at the door and it desires for you and you must master it. You, you see, just by implication, we, we see that Cain knew what he was doing was wrong, that he knew his initial, even his initial worship, his initial offering was wrong to God. He, he knew his heart wasn't right. He, he knew when he was bringing it to God that he wasn't doing the right thing, but he did it anyway. You, you see, he sat in his heart, he says, I'm just gonna do this duty. I, I'm just gonna give what people expect. I'm just gonna do what outwardly looks right. But God says, no, I require more of you than that. I, I require all of you. I require your best. I want all of you. And, and, and so he goes to Cain and he says, tells Cain, he says, if you do well, you, you, your whole thing could change. You see, even in the midst of him denying and, 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 and God interacting with him with these pursuing questions, he says, I, I'm going to give you grace. He says, if you do well, things will change around. But even in the midst of grace, we saw Cain in this particular text, not wanting God's grace. And he began to harden his heart. Even more. You see, sin is like a wild animal ready to pounce and to devour its victims. You, you see, uh, if, if many of you who know who um, Flip Wilson was, you might be too young, but I remember he, he would always say, the devil made me do it. Well, the devil don't make you do anything. It's you who uh, uh, suppress the spirit of God in your life and don't give you the power to overcome sin. It's you who go out to those places where you shouldn't go. It's you who do things and say things and, and, and interact with people you shouldn't interact with. You, you see, what the devil does is he set that temptation out there and, and, and if you are on uh, with the Spirit of God, you can overcome your temptations, but you have to decide to say, I'm not going to let the Spirit of God control my life and I'm going to fall into these temptations. So, don't be fooled today that the devil is making you do something. No, if you're caught in addiction, if you're caught in a sin, it's not the devil it's you. You have to work through and let God empower you to give you what you need. 
You, you see, that, that, yeah, there's sometimes when there's an addiction that you might need some external help, but you have to be the person who goes out and seeks that help. Even if someone gives you help, you have to decide to accept it. And so this morning, this tells us, this text tells us, it's about you. It's about your decision to do what God wants you to do. Now, if you look at verse 8, it says, Cain told Abel, his brother, and he told him to come out into the field, and he rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. And in, ang in anger, Cain took the life of another human being. And, and, and we see, it says, and he rose up in some translation. And it's appropriate to say he rose up because he rose up to kill his brother is, is, is a direct consequence of the falling of his continents. He rose up and killed and his continents fell. And so that tells us this morning that when you do wrong, there are some consequences to those sins. That his continents fell, even in his state of sin. He, he, he knew it was wrong. He can't say that I didn't know killing someone was wrong. He knew it was wrong because he called him out into the field. He said, come out into the field and where there was no help and he knew it. He said, this was premeditated murder. He said, I'm thinking about it. I'm angry. God accepted his offering but not mine. You, you see, we need to understand this morning that when you aren't doing what God wants you to do, it, it's like a train you get on. You, you do one sin, it, it, it leads to the next sin and to the next sin. And then when you look back at life, you say, what happened to me? I would have never done that. That's why it's so important to keep control of your life. Now, now you, you, you know what I'm talking about you when when we talk about you you, you may say preacher I, I would never kill anybody that, that, you know I, that's that's not me I, 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 I wouldn't do that but if you really think about it how many people have you assassinated with your words or with your attitude or with your thoughts you, 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 you know what I mean. You know what I'm talking about. Word assassination. I, I, I find that women are very good at this, that they can put words together like no one else can. You, you know what I'm talking about. A, a wife can literally kill the spirit of her husband by her words. You, 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 you've heard it. You no good for nothing, so-called man. You, you, you heard those types of words. Men, sometimes your attitude towards your wife is so dismissive that they feel unloved, uncared for, and even dismissed. You see, our words, our attitudes, and oftentimes even what we think can hurt the people we love the most. You, you see, what the, the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. And, and so the Bible calls us to constantly renew our minds by the word of God. So if, 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 if you might say, I would never physically kill somebody, but be mindful of how you treat people. If, if you have a ministry and everybody's running from your ministry, it might be your attitude. It, you know, if, if people can't stand to be around you, you need to think twice. You have to check your attitude and see what you're doing. And, and, and I know that it's, it's hard to be corrected. I, I don't like correction, but you, you know God uses correction to make us better men and women of this world. You see, uh, the lesson we see here is, is that, lesson four is that jealousy and anger can be destructive. Jealousy and anger can be destructive. You, you, you see, we, we learn from the murder of Abel that uncontrolled emotions can be very destructive. And, and it was certainly the case with Abel and Cain. You see, it wasn't Abel's fault that Cain's uh, sacrifice wasn't uh, accepted by God, but he paid the consequences of it, right? And, and, and so that tells us this morning that when you have uncontrolled anger issues, it can lead down a road to destruction. But, but, but when God accepts Abel's offering and rejects Cain, Cain directed his anger and jealousy towards his brother. He should have been trying to fix it. You see, at first it was a state. He, he was mad at God, and, and, and he knew he couldn't do nothing to God, so he said, I, I'm going to do something to the next best thing. I'm going to take it out on my brother. And, and this tells us this morning that anger need to be controlled. I, I can't say it enough. Oftentimes when I uh, counsel a uh, husband and wife and, and they get mad and they, you know, it's like physical stuff and I, I say, always just stop. If you feel yourself out of control, stop. One of you leave and come back. 
Because if you hit someone, you, you damage the relationship like no other. You, you, it's harder to get that relationship back in, 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 in the right thing if, if that physicality happens. And so we need to be mindful that we cannot let anger misdirect us. And, and this leads us to our fifth point. You can't hide your sin from God. You can't hide your sin from God. If you, if you look at verse 9 very quickly, we, we see that uh, Cain foolishly thought that he could hide his sin from God. And, and, and he, he goes and he says, you know, um, um, God asked him, um, where, where is your brother? He's like, I don't know. I don't know where he is. He's like, am, am I his keeper? And, and, and God knew, and, and if, you, if, you, you, if you know the text of Genesis, he, God asked the same question to Adam and Eve when they sinned. You know, where, where, where are you? And, and they started lying. And, 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 and so this tells us right from the fact that, you know, people say, you know, um, um, how, how, why am I affected because of Adam's sin? Well, this text tells us that, you know, sin is inherited. We're going to do the same thing. He, 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 they did the same thing as their parents did. Cain was lying to God in the garden. And even in the midst of his lying state, God still had grace on him. You see, God is continuously trying to bring us back towards him. Even in the midst of his wrath, God says, I I'm going to give you some mercy. You, you, you see, when, when he was asking Cain about all these things, it, it wasn't about what he should have done. He was, Cain was saying, it, nothing had to do with Cain. He said, it was them, you, not me. You see, I am I, my brother's keeper. Now, this particular text is tailored to teach us this morning that even in the midst of being corrected and in the midst of our sin, God loves us so much that he doesn't want us to be caught in the trap of sin. You, you see, sometimes we can be in the trap of sin so long that we, we don't even realize the consequences. We, we, we're, we're, we, 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 we do, 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 and then we look back and say... Wow, look at all the mess I created. And, 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 and so God is saying to Cain, there's got to be some consequences. And so that leads us to lesson six. All sin has consequences. All sin has consequences. Now, we see in, in the text, in, in verse uh, 14, that uh, he's cursed. And he curses the ground um, that... that um, that he tells he was a farmer, right? And so he, he said, you, you're not going to be productive anymore. He says, the consequences of your sins, you're not going to be productive, and I'm going to exile you from this territory. And so he's off. And even in the midst of his correction, Cain again says, hey, this is too much for me to bear. What am I to do? I, people are going to kill me. P people are going to destroy me. What, what's going to happen? And even in the midst of the punishment, we see the consequences. God still gives mercy. You see, he says, yeah, I'm going to punish you. If you look at 14, he says, I'm going to punish you, but I'm also going to give you a mark. And many scholars don't know what the mark is. Some say it was a tattoo. Some say it was a hairstyle. They don't really know what it is, but he says, I'm going to give you a mark. And when everybody see that mark, they're going to leave you alone. And that brings us to our last lesson. Thank God for his grace. Amen. Thank God for God's grace. You, you, you see, he gave Cain a mark so that he would be protected from his enemies. You see, the consequences of his sins were still there. But he says, I'm going to protect you even in the midst of you denying me. And, and other texts in the New Testament says he really never ever changed his heart. And so you might be wondering sometimes, why does it look like God spares the people in the world? Because God has mercy and grace for everybody. But we have a special grace for us because we accepted his love. And, and so we, we, we see, you, you, you may be here today and, and say, what is my mark? What mark does God have for me? Who am I protected from? Well, the Bible says that the devil can't get to us unless God permits him. And so our mark today is simply the blood of Jesus Christ on our hearts. You see, when the devil comes after us, we are washed by the blood of the Lamb. Isn't that good news this morning? That when someone is after you, you say, I'm covered by the blood of God. 
it was the blood of God this morning uh, that sustains us even in the midst of our trials uh, and even in the midst of our troubles. Uh, it is the blood of God this morning. Uh, you see, God so loved the world uh, that he looked down and seen the world in trouble uh, and he did not do nothing. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus the very Christ. Uh, isn't that good news this morning uh, that he sent his son to die on a cross at Calvary? Uh, and didn't he die? Uh, didn't Jesus die on the cross? Uh, he didn't play dead, but he was really dead on the cross. Uh, but the good news this morning uh, is that they tell me uh, after three days he rose again. Uh, isn't that good news this morning? Uh, isn't God good? Isn't God good? Isn't God good this morning? Uh, if God is good, get on your feet and praise Him. Uh, God is good. Uh, God is good this morning. God deserves uh, our praise. Amen, amen. God deserves our praise. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Cooper, for that awesome word. God has his mark upon your life and my mark, upon your life and my life. We are covered by the blood.